good morning. Welcome to New Life Christian Church. We're glad to see you today. Um, we certainly want to, to give a thank you to those who have served their country uh, and recognize this Memorial Day weekend. We honor those who lost their lives uh, in, that, um, in that fight, and so we certainly um, encourage you to pray for those who, who were. This is not a, a, just a long weekend um, with barbecues and things like that. Th- those things are fine, but um, to, to pray for those who are struggling this weekend because it's a reminder of significant loss in their lives. And so we certainly honor those folks who, who gave that ultimate sacrifice for the good of our country, uh, and, and we're thankful for their willingness to do so. One, one of the freedoms that we have um, is to gather together, and we are uh, exceedingly grateful for that. And so I'm glad you're here. Uh, welcome to New Life Christian Church. I want to say good morning to anybody watching online with us. Thanks for joining us via Facebook or YouTube. We're glad that you can be with us. Um, it is a blessing to gather. I'm excited to continue our series, and we kind of did an introduction last week. This week, we're going to dive into our first story, and so I'm looking forward to sharing with you this morning. Let's stand, and we'll open with a word of prayer. God, we are thankful for today. Thank you for this opportunity to be together in this place. We are thankful for all of your blessings. And Father, we're thankful for this Memorial Day weekend. We can uh, celebrate, remember, and honor um, those who have given their lives in service to our country. And we're thankful um, for their willingness to to do that, Um, for people they would never meet, for their benefit, that they would go uh, and serve their country in that way. We, We cannot say thank you enough. And so we pray for those that are struggling this weekend, those that this is a difficult weekend for, uh, because of that, uh, that we would be an encouragement to them as we honor their loved ones with our celebrations as well. And Father, I pray that this service would be pleasing to you as we sing your praises, as we study your word. Father, as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ through time of communion, I pray that you would guide us through the service to grow closer to you, challenge us through your word this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Well, as we prepare for a time of communion, if you haven't had a chance to grab communion on your way in, I'd encourage you to step to the back and do so. Or if you're watching online with us, we'd love for you to, to grab your communion elements there at home. And we'll take communion together after we read Scripture and pray. I want to share with you from Ephesians chapter 2 uh, this morning, beginning of verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously lived according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespass, trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you were saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift. Not from works, so that no one can boast. And I read that passage this week, and I got to thinking, you know, a lot of us aren't very good at receiving undeserved gifts. We, uh, we get a paycheck, and we're like, I earned that. We're good with that, right? We get maybe birthday presents, and we say, well, it is my birthday. I guess that's okay. Although, I don't know that we earned that. Our mothers earned that more than we did. But I think when it comes to somebody coming to you out of the blue and just doing something amazing for you, somebody giving you something or, or helping you with something or, or just, just blowing you away with their generosity in a situation where you can say, listen, I did absolutely nothing to deserve that, I think sometimes some of us actually struggle with that. We struggle... To, to accept undeserved gifts because we have this inner desire to, to earn it. And yet when we look at the cross, when we look at what God did for us through Jesus Christ, completely undeserved. You and I have done nothing to earn it. In fact, we can do nothing to earn it. And we certainly don't deserve it. And yet God gave it so freely. When Jesus died for the cross, there wasn't a prerequisite for who that was for. There wasn't anybody left off the list. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for all. In fact, what's always kind of stuck in the back of my mind is when he was dying on the cross, he was dying for the people who put him there. Dying for the people who carried out the physical act of putting him on the cross. They were included and those who he was dying for. You want to talk about not deserved. We don't deserve what God has done for us. And yet, we can have the hope of eternity, the hope of salvation because of Jesus. There is no greater gift. There is no more undeserved gift. And yet, it's ours. And it's why we celebrate each and every Sunday. We take the bread that represents the broken body of Jesus Christ. And the cup that represents his shed blood. And we remember that sacrifice and what it means for our lives and for our eternity. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for this time in the service when we can turn our focus so directly onto the cross and onto our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, we, we are sinful. We all have sinned. We all struggle. We all fall short on a regular basis. And yet... We can live free from that sin. We can live knowing that our salvation is not found in anything we do on our own, but it's found in Jesus. And so thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for, for sending him to defeat death in the grave, to take our place, to pay our debt. We're thankful for the salvation we have, for the hope that we have for an eternity with you. Give us your focus during this time. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Well, we're not going to start the service with a, with a kid's Sunday school song like we did last week, but I'll, I'll tell you this, um, it's still true that our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing that our God cannot do. And that, that's the whole premise we use to set up this series, that we need reminders, that we need to be reminded of the power of God, that God can and does do things that no one else can do, that there is no situation that we should be considering impossible because God can, that there is no situation in which we should be without hope because God can. And so we're going to begin today to study some of the specific moments in Scripture that help us remember this, that best illustrate the power of God. And and for me, one of the best ways to go about that, I believe, is to, to try to place ourselves in the story, to try to imagine that we were there in the time and place where it happened and in the footsteps of the people it happened to. And so today I want you to go back with me to the days of God's people living uh, as captive slaves in Egypt. They had been there for quite some time. Uh, In fact, it had just become kind of accepted that this is our life now, that we belong to the Egyptians, we are their slaves, this is where we live, this is our home. And uh, in some ways, you know, we see through the, 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 what would follow, in some ways their life wasn't really that bad. They looked back on it fondly pretty quickly once they left, but they were slaves, they were captive in Egypt. And so God tells Moses that he, Moses, will be leading God's people out of Egypt and out of slavery. Moses isn't so sure of himself as a part of this plan, but he ultimately trusts God, and God allows his brother Aaron to speak for him. And so Moses and Aaron approach Pharaoh about letting God's people go. And as you can imagine, Pharaoh isn't so keen on his free workforce walking out of Egypt. So he says no. And thus begins a a back and forth between Moses and Pharaoh, really a back and forth between God and Pharaoh, where Moses and Aaron come and say, let my people go. And Pharaoh says no, and God brings about a plague or two or three, and then Moses comes back with Aaron and says, let my people go, and Pharaoh says no, and God comes back with a plague or two or three. And this isn't what we're focusing on today, but if you want to talk about proof of power, I do want to look at the plagues for just a moment. I mean, God turned the Nile River into blood. You don't see that every day. He brought frogs to cover the land. He brought a plague of gnats and then a plague of flies, then a plague bringing death to all the livestock of the Egyptians, then a plague that caused boils on the Egyptian people, then a plague of hail, then a plague of locusts, and then one of darkness, and ultimately the death of every firstborn of Egypt. There's ten separate displays of power that God brought upon the people of Egypt, and what's so interesting to me through these plagues, is a progression that we sometimes miss. Because when the water became blood, Scripture tells us that the Egyptian magicians were able to do the same things by their secret arts. Calling on the dark forces, or however you want to to interpret that Scripture, the Egyptians were able to duplicate the water into blood. They They lessened the impressive nature of what God had done, by doing the same thing. And then that happened again with the plague of frogs. Scripture tells us they were able to duplicate the plague of frogs. Then we get the gnats, and that's where things begin to change because the magicians could not duplicate it. And in fact, the magicians themselves told Pharaoh, this is clearly the finger of God. And so Pharaoh doesn't see it yet, but even the magicians begin to recognize that God is more powerful than they are. The plague of flies was even more convincing, as not a single fly was on God's people or their animals. If you've been around flies, you know how improbable this is. If you're in a group of people and you're outside and there are flies around, and they're bugging everybody, but there's one person who's going, oh, not bothering me at all. We don't like that person, do we? Because for some, I don't know how, it doesn't usually happen, but every once in a while there's somebody going, they're not bugging me, no big deal. In this case, the Egyptians and their livestock were absolutely covered and not a single fly was on God's people or on their animals. The plague of boils was such that the magicians could not even stand before Pharaoh because they were so much in pain. God's power had rendered their power defunct. The plague of hail is interesting. 
because the Egyptians were actually given the opportunity to take cover. They were warned, hey, if you fear the Lord, take cover. And many did, and therefore were spared while no Israelites were affected by the hail at all. The hail, in fact, convinced Pharaoh to let them go. Pharaoh said, all right, go ahead and go. And so when God stopped the hail, Pharaoh changed his mind. Same thing happened with the locusts. They overran the Egyptians. Pharaoh relented, and then the locusts were blown into the Red Sea, and Pharaoh changed his mind again. And so as the plagues went on, increasingly it seemed like more and more people, not necessarily Pharaoh, but more and more people were understanding, listen, this God that the Israelites serve is doing things no one else can do. And when you get to the undeniable plagues, as if the others should not have been enough, darkness over the Egyptians for three days while the Israelites still had light, and then ultimately the death of the firstborn of Egypt, those simply could not be duplicated because it was God's power on display. And understand there's a whole additional discussion about God hardening Pharaoh's heart um, that we're not going to go into today. Scripture is clear that God had a hand in Pharaoh's kind of flip-flopping but that it was to increase the visibility of the power of God on display. And I think we often see this as God showing his power to the Egyptians, but they weren't the only ones who who needed to be affected by this display of the power of God. The Israelites themselves, God's people, needed a reminder of his power before they left Egypt. And after the plague of the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh really did let God's people go this time. And we'll pick up in Exodus chapter 13. We'll spend most of our time today in Exodus chapter 13 and chapter 14. We'll begin in verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. And the Israelites went out of, up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. And by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And so we continue to see the power of God and the way that he leads his people with this amazing pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, this guiding system and this way to to move at night. And we see God lead the people on the longer road instead of the shorter road to avoid problems. Because had they taken the shorter route, they would have had to cross through fortified land, Philistine land, and it's likely nothing would have sent them back to Egypt quite like war. And so that longer route led them directly to the Red Sea. And I think there's an important lesson for us there that if God takes us on the long road instead of the shortcut, there's probably a reason. I think sometimes we spend a lot of time going, God, why isn't this easier? Why hasn't this happened sooner? Why are you asking me to wait? Why are you making me take the long way around? When God asks us to wait or to take a different route, there's usually a reason that he can see clearly that we simply cannot see yet. But we need to trust. In this story, it's all about trust. And so I have a question for us this morning. It's an important one before we go any further into the story. Putting yourselves in the shoes of the Israelites. Putting yourselves in the shoes of God's people here. How much power would it take for you to fully trust God? How many displays of power? What would you have need to see from God before you would fully trust God. And if you were at the point where you would say, I fully trust God, how long would that trust last? What would it take to break it? Because you think about the Israelites, they have seen so much. They are literally being led by not only Moses, but by this pillar of fire, this pillar of cloud. They saw and experienced these 10 plagues. I'm sure it was more effective on the Egyptians, but the Israelites saw it too. They saw the darkness and light. They saw the flies. They saw the gnats. They saw the frogs. They saw the water. They saw it all. They saw their firstborn son spared while Egyptians weren't. They saw and understood that it was God who had allowed them to walk out of slavery and be free. 
If anyone should have fully trusted God after all they had seen and experienced firsthand, you would think it would have been these Israelites. But as Moses leads them into the desert, and certainly as Pharaoh and his army began to pursue them, the trust began to break down quickly. Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. Pharaoh had changed his mind. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. My, how quickly we forget. Their trust in God had so eroded so quickly that they claimed to never have wanted out of slavery in the first place. They said, didn't we tell you to leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians? Because seeing the Egyptians coming, they assume that this will be their death. And to me, that says something very important. That says their trust was not in God to save them. The same God who brought ten plagues. The same God who brought them out of slavery. That he was not going to save them. They did not expect to be spared. They had so many reasons to place their trust fully in God. And yet it's clear that's not where their trust was. Verse 13, Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. I love that. Because Moses doesn't just tell them that God is with you. He doesn't just say God will deliver you. He actually tells the Israelite people, not only is God going to deliver you, you won't even be in the fight. Again, they have so many reasons to trust, yet they were struggling. And so Moses, he reassures them that not only is God in control, God is actually all they need. There was nothing else that was going to matter, that God was running this fight. Verse 15, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. And so again, we keep seeing miraculous, powerful things happen as God puts a barrier, His barrier, between the Israelites and the Egyptians so that they can make it through the night. And the reason they needed to make it through the night was because the water began to part. And I know if you've ever seen the story of the Red Sea put in some sort of illustrated form, we have this idea in our head that God just said part and it was done. But Scripture is very clear here, verse 21, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. He was giving them another opportunity to trust him through the night that he would keep them from the Egyptians. The waters divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving and the Egyptians said, Let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And don't miss that because here we have another instance where some of the Egyptian people, even if Pharaoh can't, have recognized that God is in control. Even if some of the Israelites are still doubting that they've realized clearly the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. 
The Egyptians were fleeing toward it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him and in Moses, His servant. I would hope so. I would hope after experiencing something like this that they would put their hope back in God. But the question quickly became, how long would that trust last? See, there are stories from Scripture that are imaginable for us that we really can imagine. And then there are some where you get to a point and you say, I don't think we can begin to understand what it would have actually been like to see those waters part. I think any, any illustration of it, any picture of it, any video recreation of it, even on something like VeggieTales, none of it does justice to what was actually going on. I don't think we can understand what it would have been like to be on that shore. I would suggest we can only begin to imagine how it would have felt to take even one step between the wall of water. To begin to walk where water had just been. To begin to walk where really you're in danger because if the water comes down, you're done. We can only begin to imagine how much trust it would have taken to take that step onto now dry land. But don't miss this. Each additional step taken between those walls of water required more trust in God. Because there was still a wall of water on both sides, and that's just not natural. Because with each step towards the middle, you were farther away from true dry ground. Each step took trust until they were safely on the other side, and then they had to continue to trust that God would not allow the Egyptians to follow. I think... That sometimes we want trusting God to be a one-time decision that just sticks. If I choose to trust God today that God can do this, then I'll always just trust. But the truth is, trusting God is a day-to-day, moment-to-moment decision. It's something we have to be intentional about. You see, I'm afraid we have short memories just like the Israelites did. Because after all they had seen and experienced, they were still grumbling about their conditions just a short time after being freed from slavery. And the truth is, as amazing as this experience was of walking between the walls of water, it wasn't very long before they were grumbling again. We see it throughout the entire history of God and His people, that God does amazing things for His people. He saves them, He rescues them, they worship Him, and then very quickly, they find something to complain about. And their trust deteriorates. And it's often one of three things. They're either hungry, they're lost, or they're in danger. And they're still in the desert here. So as you can imagine, it wasn't long before they were really all three of those things. Hungry, lost, and in danger. And yet God shows over and over again when they're hungry, He feeds them. When they're lost, He guides them. When they're in danger, he rescues them, and in that moment, they're thankful to God. But it's not much later that they're right back to being hungry, being lost, or being in danger, and wondering, why is God so far off? Where has God been? It's very much, what have you done for me lately? And I wonder how true of us that is. That we have short memories, that we feel abandoned by God when something bad happens. I'm afraid it happens to most of us. I see it kind of like online restaurant reviews. I'm not a big fan of the online review process because I think it's a little bit unfair. It ends up being pretty biased in one direction just because of, of human nature. But this is what I've noticed. If, if 10 different people have a great experience at a restaurant, and one person has a bad experience, you can almost bet that the one person who had a bad experience will be the one to take the time to leave a review, right? But even worse than that, if one person has 10 great experiences at a restaurant and then has one bad one, it is 
significantly likely in the world we live in today that they will only write a review for the bad one, not for the 10 good. It's very much a what have you done for me lately thought process. We tend to forget the good and emphasize the bad, even if in quantity the good has well outweighed the bad. We see God's people do this over and over again, and I'm afraid we do it over and over again, where God has come through and come through and come through, and then things get tough for a short season, and we're like, where is God? God, you just, you're just never there for me. You're so far. I feel abandoned. I feel let down. And we've lost that trust when there's no reason we should have lost that trust. Why is this such a struggle for us? I think part of it is because we take the power of God for granted. I think part of this is because we can't seem to keep all that God has done in the forefront of our minds. and We forget. So how do we fix this issue? How do we better remember what God has done in our lives that only God can do? Because if the Israelites could forget, or at least set aside what they experienced at the Red Sea, how are we supposed to remember what God has done in our lives? Well, I think there's actually an important lesson in a different story in Scripture about God taking a sea and turning it into a highway, about God parting waters for someone to cross through. I bet some of you didn't know that there were actually more stories like this one in Scripture. There are actually two more. One of them is in the book of Joshua. Joshua was God's chosen leader for Israel after Moses. Joshua, in fact, was God's chosen leader to take the Israelites into the promised land. And in order to do that, they had to cross the Jordan River. Now understand, the Jordan River is not the Red Sea. We're talking about two very different bodies of water. The Jordan River is a flowing body of water. It's not nearly as wide as what they had to cross in the Red Sea, but it didn't change the fact that they had to cross it. And on top of that, based on the time of year, we understand that it was when the story took place, the Jordan River was also likely at flood stage, which made it even more dangerous than it usually would have been to cross the Jordan River. And so Joshua tells the people that as a display of God's power to remind them who he is, to remind them that he is with them, that God would allow them to cross the river on dry ground, that they were to follow the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and that when those priests' feet touched the water, the water would recede, and it would stand up like a wall, allowing them to cross. This sounds very familiar, doesn't it? It should have to the people as well. And sure enough, that's what happened. The priests with the Ark of the Covenant stood in the middle of the river and the entire nation of Israel passed on dry ground. It's amazing. It's unforgettable. There's no word you could actually use to describe it well enough because this is just, it's crazy. But this time, this time God gave them a way to better remember what he had done. In fact, he instructed Joshua to tell the people to gather stones from the river and to build a monument to what God had done that day. But I want to read it because I don't want us to miss something very important about these stones and about this monument. Joshua chapter 4, beginning verse 8. So, So the Israelites did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, as the Lord had told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to their camp where they put them down. Joshua set up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant had stood. And they are there to this day. Now I understand that can be a little bit confusing because it sounds like they took the rocks out and left the rocks in. Some, some biblical scholars think there are two monuments. Some think there's one. That doesn't matter for what we're talking about today. There was a monument built, and the stones came from a very specific place. Joshua took up the 12 stones that had been in the middle of the Jordan at the spot where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant stood in the middle of the Jordan River. They took the stones meant for a monument, stones meant for a monument that would remind them for generations of the power of God from the exact spot that it took the most trust in him to even walk. Because when you're at the center of the river, you are no closer to either shore. There was no more dangerous place they could be 
than the center of the Jordan River. No one would have ever wanted to be in the middle of the Jordan River. And so God said, take the stones from the middle of the river and build a monument to what I've done. The place that took the most trust is the place their symbol of that trust came from. And I think that's really important. Because when we're in the throes of it, when we're struggling and God begins to carry us through, our focus is on God for sure. But when life gets back to normal, we tend to distance ourselves from what God has done for us. And we cannot afford to do that. We cannot afford to forget what God has done. We cannot afford to forget that God is the one who carries us through the struggles and the trials of this life. We cannot forget that God is the one who can be trusted. And I'll tell you this, I don't think we need to build a bunch of stone monuments to remember what God has done, but we need to do something or we'll continue to forget. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to forget. It's not intentional, but we need to be intentional to keep it from happening. We need to slow down in this life long enough to realize that when God is doing amazing things in our lives, when God is doing what only God can do, if that means writing them down, we need to write them down. If that means keeping a journal, we need to keep a journal. If that means we keep post-it notes so we can stick them right in our Bible, that's what we need to do so that we can write down and remind ourselves, I am not the one who carried myself through this situation. It was all God. We need that reminder because the truth is we live in a broken world. And another time is going to come when we need to put our trust in God. It really comes daily. And if we haven't reminded ourselves, I'm afraid we won't put our trust where it truly belongs. As forgetful as we are, how much quicker will we forget without some sort of record, without some sort of reminder? And this can be anything. And that's what I love about this idea of of building monuments to the things that God has done. It can be anything. And it's unique to you. I'll tell you a story about one, one that I have probably wouldn't have considered a monument, but it has, it has remained one for me. Um, one of the, probably one of the worst seasons of my life was just before we moved here to Winchester 11 years ago. Sometimes it's hard for me to believe it was 11 years ago. Um, some of you agree. Uh, that, that was a long time ago. And we came from Ohio. I was serving at a church there in Ohio, and, and we'd been there for um, almost two years, and it was not a good fit. It was not a good situation. And if you've ever had a job that just wasn't right for you, it can get to the point where, where you end up suffering mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I'll be honest with you, I was suffering in all four of those areas. I, I don't say that to be dramatic. That's really how it felt. I was, I was physically ill by the time I came home most days. And so I began to, to wonder if ministry was for me. Some, some of it was brought on by myself. I had exceedingly thin skin. I did not take criticism very well, and I was criticized a lot, and so it just, I just let it eat me. I've gotten better in that area. Not great, but better, but the truth is, I just wasn't sure I could handle this for the long term, and so I sought God. I asked God what he would have me do. I, I sent out some resumes. I did all of those things, and, and lo and behold, God worked out amazingly, and here I stand 11 years later, but you know what I still have I have not ever been able to bring myself to delete all of the emails from that job search. I have all of my email correspondence with every church I talked to at that time, specifically, especially all the New Life correspondence, sending my resume, receiving information, the invitation for coming to visit, the details about the visit. I have all of those things in my email still. And to me... I'm not sure if I realized it till this week, but those serve as a monument to a time when God stepped up in a big way in my life, where I was ready to give up, where I was ready to say, this isn't for me anymore, and God came through and did what only God can do. I don't ever want to forget that I had nothing to do with that. It was God. And so I keep those emails It can be whatever you want it to be, but we need to to remember, we need to remind ourselves, we need to remind one another of the times when God has shown how amazingly powerful He is, the times when God has shown, listen, there are things I can do that no one else can do. We'll let ourselves down, we'll let each other down. God will not let us down. 
He does not always answer the way we ask him to, but he is always there and he can do what no one else can do. And we can open the scriptures and that's important. We can open the scriptures and be reminded of the mighty power of our God and be inspired and have our trust renewed. And I encourage you, if, if you are finding yourself lacking trust in God, read the Bible and it'll help. But just as powerful should be the reminders in our own lives of all that he has done for us. We have no right to forget, so we need to remember. In the center of the river, in the places in our lives that take the most trust in God, when we see God respond, when we see God come through, we need to pick up those rocks and build a monument. Refuse to forget all that God has done, because the next time, when you look at that monument, you won't worry. You'll simply trust God. Every day we need to place our trust in God. Every day, probably before our feet hit the floor, we need to remind ourselves that if our trust is anywhere but God, it's in the wrong place. Our God turns seas into highways. He can do anything, and he'll do it again. Let's pray. God, we are thankful that you are the God who turns seas into highways. Father, that you can do anything, that nothing is impossible for you. And Father, for the times that we have forgotten that, for the times that our memories have been short, we are sorry. And so Father, help us to remember, help us to build those monuments to remember all that you've done in our lives. Father, that when we see them, we are inspired. Our confidence grows in you. that the next time we face struggles, we will not fear. Instead, we will simply trust and know that you are in control. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've never made a a first-time decision for Jesus Christ and accepted him as your Savior, that's something I would love the chance to talk to you about. Um, I would love the chance to sit down with you, to pray with you, to have that conversation. And so if you've been thinking about that, if you've been on the fence, if you're just not sure but you want to talk about it, I would encourage you to not leave this place today without letting me know that so we can set up a time to talk about what it looks like to place your faith in Jesus Christ and follow him in obedience. So please don't leave today without us having that conversation. There's a couple things I want you to know uh, before you go this morning. If you're a guest with us, we're certainly glad you're here. We want to thank you for joining us for worship this morning. We'd love for you to stop by the link located in the center of the hallway out there. Um, Somebody will be there to greet you, and we'd love for you to fill out a Connect card. Um, It's just some basic information so we can follow up. And if you fill out that card, just by doing that, um, you'll be giving, uh, we'll give on your behalf a $10 donation to one of our local partners. Right now, that partner is Froggy's Closet. And Froggy's does amazing work for kids in need and foster families in our area. And so we're supporting them this quarter with our Connect Card donation. So just by filling out a card, you're making a difference in the community. We're going to celebrate our graduates on Sunday, June 13th. We're excited about that. Uh, Anthony's already been in touch with um, parents of, of high school seniors. We also want to make sure anybody who has graduated from any other you know, graduate school, any of that kind of stuff, um, we want you included too. So high school graduates should send, uh, submit 10 photos through the years to Anthony as soon as possible. And then all other graduates submit a recent photo along with the details of their graduation to Anthony as soon as possible. And we'll have a video that day and have an opportunity to celebrate all of those folks together. We are excited to not need to utilize kids' signups anymore and to also have a lot more chairs in the room. I'm not sure if you noticed when you came in. This continues to give us room for more people, but also continues to give you room if you would prefer to spread out, that you've still got plenty of room to do that. And so um, while we are no longer restricted, we wanted to continue to give you that option to have some extra space if you so desire. So I want to thank you for being a part of our service today. It is always good to gather together. We have a special guest that is going to come and close our service for us with a very important announcement, and so I will invite him to the stage at this time. Good morning. As you may have seen out back, the construction has started. There's dirt being moved and things happening. We were waiting on what's called a soil uh, permit, a soil disturbance permit. That's a strange thing. Obviously, we wondered what that was. And 
So apparently, before you can move soil, you have to ask soil if you can disturb them. And so uh, we'd been waiting. I don't know whether the email was broke or they were on vacation, but finally the soil got back with us and they said, you have my permission to disturb us. So we, the, the disturbing has begun, okay? So you'll see there's lots of stuff out there, but that's not gonna change things. We still are going to have a groundbreaking, as we mentioned last week. So some of you may have been to a groundbreaking. Uh, you may have seen it on the news. They're kind of boring. You get people in suits making big speeches, and then a couple people you don't know turn over some dirt, and everybody claps and goes home. Ours is not gonna be like that. We're gonna have a party. We're going to have balloons. We're going to have things for the kids. We're going to have music. We're going to have snacks. We're going to have cake, okay? So we hope you'll come out and, 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 and join us. We're going to have fun. We're going to celebrate. We're going, we want to let God know that we, we see and recognize and are thankful for the blessings that he's put on new life in the past, in the present, in the future. We're excited about the, the new building and, and getting going with that. Uh, you know, the, the church is not the building. The church is us, okay? It's what we do. It's how we live our lives. It's how we show God's love. And so the building will give us a better chance to do that, to serve the community and be effective. So uh, we hope that you'll come out and, and be part of that. Uh, we're going to have lots of fun. And everybody, the thing that's going to be unique, everybody, men, women, children that are there, are going to be able to participate in the groundbreaking. You're thinking, well, how could that be possible? Well, all I can tell you is you've got to come out to find out. All right? So we're going to have a good time. We're going to raise a little hallelujah. We're going to tell God we love him. We're going to get excited about this new project. And uh, as many of you are already supporting it. And so we, we hope you'll come out and have some fun with us. We're going to have the tent set up. And we're going to have a good time. So uh, good question from the back. When is it? When is it? When? when oh, I got, hold on. I got the date. No. Oh, here's the date right here. Saturday, June the 5th, 2 o'clock, that's next Saturday, and I'm speaking with you on the level, okay, on the level, so it's true, got to be there. Anyway, we hope you'll come out, we're going to have a good time, it's going to be fun to celebrate and let God know that we love him and how excited we are about what's happening at New Life, so we hope you'll come out and be with us, so next Saturday, 2 o'clock. All right, let's all stand, we're going to have a closing prayer here. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to assemble and worship you. We thank you for the word and for your word and its inspiration and guidance and direction. Help us to look at those miracles in our life that we've had, and we know miracles to come through your hands. We just thank you for loving us. We thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross so that we'd have that hope of salvation and eternity with you. Uh, go with us now as we leave this place. Uh, help us not to miss an opportunity to show your love to someone. Uh, help us to have you in our hearts and in our minds. And uh, just thank you for loving us. We praise you and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.